Hey, and welcome back. In the mix of things I do that fill up my time as a professional musician, one that always excites me is doing session work and recording. I recently had the opportunity to spend four days in a studio across the state with a great group of jazz musicians to work on a new album coming out in 2023. Since I needed to head out bright and early Thursday morning, I spent most of Wednesday night prepping a few things for this extended trip. As you can see, I started out by printing charts for the songs we'd be recording. Of course, on live gigs, I typically go paperless and use my iPad, but in this setting it made more sense to use paper so I could easily write notes and changes and also avoid turning pages on these charts where the music extends across two to four pages. When I record in a studio, I find it important to have a few options for sounds, so in this case, I decided to pack a few snares, extra cymbal choices, and of course, a number of smaller dampening and accessory options to augment the existing sound of my drums. In addition to a variety of musical tools, I needed to pack a pretty hefty load of camera and recording gear, because in addition to trying to document this weekend for my own purposes, I was also grabbing footage and clips to use in promotional materials for this project as it gets released. So once I had all this packed up from my own studio, I brought it upstairs and began the process of packing my drums, hardware, and cymbals all in the car tonight to save me from doing it the next morning. For this project, I decided to bring along my DIY Bebop kit that I built a couple years ago from Keller Shells. This kit has been a workhorse for me live, and honestly, I just feel most comfortable playing on these drums. Once I had the car loaded up, I turned my attention to packing the more typical items for a trip, like clothing, toiletries, chargers, and all those sorts of things. With this being a longer trip, I made sure to pack a bit of extras and options so I'd be covered for anything, but once I had it all packed up, it was time to call it a night and get some sleep before heading out of town. I had to wake up around 7 a.m. to have time to get showered, get together, and pack up the last few things I needed, but I was finally able to hit the road around 8 a.m. The trip to Eau Claire is about 200 miles, or three hours, so I had plenty of time to catch up on some podcasts and sports talk radio. But while this drive montage plays out, let me tell you a little bit more about how this recording came to be. So this album was all put together by a newer friend of mine, Jason Gessel. Jason is an amazing guitarist who relocated from Seattle, Washington to my hometown of Oshkosh, Wisconsin, right around the time of the pandemic. He and his wife, Kate, have a group called Sunday and Mr. Gessel and tour all around the country performing their unique blend of swing, Americana, and country with a real entertaining stage presence. Like myself, Jason went to college at UW-Eau Claire to be part of the renowned jazz program, and when we met at a jam session in Oshkosh last year, we immediately hit it off based on our shared experiences and mutual appreciation for a similar style of jazz. Although our paths never crossed in Eau Claire, and our stops there were decades apart, we share a ton of mutual friends, including the other two musicians involved on this project, Josh Gallagher on piano and Jeremy Betcher on bass. Both Josh and Jeremy were huge influences on me during my time in Eau Claire and were the musical big brothers I needed to help me grow into the drummer I've become today. If it weren't for these two, I don't know if I really would have developed into much of a jazz player. They picked me up when I was 19 or so, and as the drummer they were playing with moved away, they brought me into a trio that was playing two to four nights a week for the next four years. I still make it back to Eau Claire every once in a while, mostly to play with these two and catch up on my old college glory days. So when Jason reached out about recording his original music with me and two of my favorite musicians, I was eager to jump on board. In addition to the deep roots I had with all the musicians, the studio Jason chose to record this project at was a studio I'd recorded at countless times over the last 10 to 12 years. This studio is run by a great engineer, Evan Middlesworth, who I became friends with soon after he first moved to town. We met after he assisted on a recording for the university jazz ensembles, and he quickly put me to work playing all kinds of sessions at his space. Over the years, I recorded with my own groups, as a hired gun, and even made a record of my original music there in 2013. So needless to say, this whole project and trip was set to be very special for me. I pulled into the studio a little before noon, and shortly after I pulled up, the rest of the crew trickled in, and I started unloading all my drums to get set up for rehearsal. We set up all next to each other in the same room, because for the first day we'd only be rehearsing, and Friday was scheduled to be a live in-studio performance for people who bought tickets to see us play this music. There was plenty of catching up to do, as I hadn't seen Josh and Jeremy in nearly six months, and I hadn't seen Evan in more like five to six years. 
But after an hour or so, we were all set up to begin practicing and getting these tunes under our belts as a quartet. Jason and I had spent a lot of time over the summer getting together to run these songs and develop the arrangements, but this was the first time all four of us could play it together. We spent about four to five hours working through all 11 songs with a few breaks intermixed, and Jason was thoughtful enough to bring plenty of snacks and even made us some soup to keep us taken care of and not have to worry about any meals. And of course, in addition to all involved on playing and producing this project, I can't forget to mention Kate and Jackie for keeping us company along the way. We called it a night sometime between 5 and 6 p.m., and then it was time for Jason, Kate, Jackie, and I to head to our Airbnb where we'd be staying for the next four nights. Friday morning quickly went from having most of the day off to being jam-packed for me. I woke up around 6.30 a.m. to get showered, dressed, and leave the Airbnb for the day. Before calling it a night on Thursday, I caught up with one of my closest college friends, Scott, who teaches middle school band in Eau Claire. He mentioned he'd have his percussion only class Friday morning at 7.30 a.m., so I decided to join him. Scott's been using a number of my teaching sheets and warm-ups with these students, and we both thought it would be really fun and valuable to have me stop in, run the group through some of the rep, and talk a little bit about my career as a percussionist. This ended up being a great time, and I'm glad I was not only able to give back to the students, but catch up with one of my closest friends, Scott, and see how things were going at the new school he had moved over to. After leaving the school, I hit the road from Minneapolis, which is a little over an hour drive. I try to make the trip over to the Twin Cities whenever I can on these Eau Claire trips. I have plenty of friends in that area, and in addition, there's a great number of drum shops, music venues, and other things happening in this region. For this trip, I had a bit more of a task involving Clash Drums, where I shot a video which will be coming out on my channel in the near future. I won't share too much in this video, but this shop is full of amazing vintage gear along with one of the largest selections of modern drum gear around. Before I made my way back to Eau Claire, I also made a quick stop at another great drum shop, Twin Cities Drum Collective, just a few minutes down the road from Clash. So after my quick trip over to Minneapolis, I made a pit stop back at the Airbnb to change and get everything I'd need to take with me to the studio for our quick rehearsal before our live show. But very soon after, I realized our plans were about to change dramatically. While driving over to the studio, I got a call from Jason to learn that we had a potential exposure concern within the group. I won't say the specific word to avoid this video being flagged and demonetized, but I'm pretty sure you know what I'm talking about. We immediately had to cancel the show out of concern for the guest coming into the confined space, but since everyone was symptom free and we had already spent a day together in close proximity, we decided at the very least it wouldn't be too big of a risk to spend that night recording in the studio and begin tracking as much as we could. So after I got to the studio, I started by taking my drums from the main tracking room into the ISO booth and set up my kit again and get the drums mic'd up for recording. And not to get too sidetracked, but how cool is the vibe in this booth and studio as a whole? I actually helped Evan build the walls for this booth with my jazz quartet in exchange for some free studio time there about a decade ago. And even though it's certainly changed a lot, it's still so nostalgic being back here. Everyone shared the same disappointment with having to cancel the show, but this sort of thing has become a reality for all of us working in the entertainment industry. And being able to adapt on the fly is a part of working through it. In retrospect, I think we can all say this was probably a blessing in disguise because the amount of music we had to record ahead of us was pretty overwhelming and to get a head start on recording a few of these tunes tonight could really be the best use of our limited time together. All in all, in the course of a few hours, we were able to track three tunes on this first night. The first two tunes were both in the medium-slow swing range with a pretty relaxed feel, but the third was a bit more upbeat and gave me a fun drum solo to play over with some band hits throughout. I'll drop in a few clips of each of these songs so you can get a feel for each.
listening to a number of mixes and getting takes we were happy with on all these songs, we called it a night and headed back to get some rest before a full day of tracking on Saturday. We woke up pretty early on Saturday, and after some updated testing, we found out now that our initial exposure concern was no longer a concern after everyone in question had now tested negative. I think we had mixed feelings at this point, because it was a bummer to have to cancel the show, but honestly, I think we were just all relieved we could continue our work without having the weight of this hanging over our heads for the rest of the weekend. On the way to the studio, Jason and I stopped at Racy's to grab some coffee, and this place is an institution in town, so it was great to be back. After grabbing our drinks to go, we made our way over to the studio to begin a full day of tracking. We got in about 10 a.m., and with three songs down from last night's session, we had eight remaining to get to. Of course, we knew there was really no chance that we'd be getting through all of them in one day, but we were able to get through five of them all in all. The first tune up, entitled Bill's Waltz, was a nice medium slow waltz that was very much in the spirit of the great jazz pianist, Bill Evans. We tried a few different things with texture using both brushes and sticks, but for the final take that ended up making the record, I stayed on brushes the whole time. I'll add a quick cut of this track here so you can hear what I'm talking about with this Bill Evans approach. Next up was a song called Wine and Dine, and this tune had a great arrangement that felt to me a lot like playing a big band chart with setups and hits. This tune also featured some shifting between Latin and swing, so this one took a bit to get everything to feel right, but I'll drop in the melody here so you can get a feel for the style and arrangement. to a tune called Big Chart, and I honestly can't say I have much understanding about the title, but Jason and Kate actually printed out a large version of this lead sheet to use in some pictures associated with the album, and for the guest at the show, that never happened. This tune really took a wild turn as we recorded it, and after a number of takes, we ended up having the idea to give it more of an old school feel with that bounce rhythm you'd hear in the older big band dance band era. After switching to this feel, it ended up sticking and being the approach we used for the final take. Check out a bit of that feel here. The 
fourth tune up for the day was originally an upbeat swing tune, but over the summer in the sessions I had with Jason in preparation for this recording, I brought up the idea of it being a samba, and it set really well in this style. The biggest challenge on this tune was probably the outro tag, which has a pretty unique phrasing to it. So I'll drop in a cut of this track with the outhead so you can catch that. tune for the day was Don't Crack Jack, which has quite the story attached to the title, but I think I'll just sum this one up by saying it screams Thelonious Monk to me with its angular melody and harmony. Here's a bit of the melody to show you what I mean. spent about seven hours at the studio this day, and of course there was plenty of time mixed in between takes where we were able to relax, eat some fresh made chili, listen back to takes, and just enjoy conversation with each other. But overall, this day went by really quickly. After making a quick pit stop at the Airbnb to drop some things off and get changed, I left to head out to the Lakely in downtown Eau Claire, where Josh, Jeremy, and I were going to be playing from 7 to 10 p.m. Luckily, they have a house drum kit here, so I was able to just bring in a few things, but I got there a little after six to take my time setting up not only the drums, but my mobile recording rig so I could multi-track our show. I've already shared a few videos on social media and this YouTube channel, but playing with these guys is so special for me, and over the years we've played together, we've really built a nice book of arrangements and songs. After our gig had finished, I quickly popped over to another bar downtown having some late night jazz before calling it a night. Eau Claire is a town that really has a thriving art scene, so it's not unusual to have a number of different shows in the same genre going on all at once. But after catching a few tunes at the end of their set, I made my way back to the Airbnb to prep for yet another full day of tracking. So much like Saturday, Jason and I left the Airbnb a little after 9, but instead of the traditional stop at Racy's, we stopped at a Woodman's to stock up on some more studio snacks and ingredients for some curry. Before making our way out of town to the studio, I still made sure we stopped for coffee at a Caribou, which I desperately wish we had in Oshkosh. As you've seen for a few days now, the studio is just 10 to 15 minutes outside of town, and every time I come out here, I so wish I had a space like this of my own to create music. Although the phone service is terrible, 
and the Wi-Fi is a bit spotty, it really allows you to be isolated and focus on your craft, and I really think of this place every time I imagine what I'd want in a future home and studio down the road. Day three was setting up to be a lighter to-do list, and we only had three songs left, and anywhere between five to seven hours to get it all done. Of course, if time allowed, we could go back and grab some additional takes of what we did prior, but we already had plenty of takes we were happy with, so it was really just about tackling these last few tunes left to do. But of course, these three tunes were some of the hardest on the whole project, starting off with a ballad that required a lot of focus and energy to get the feel just right. It was inspired very much from the Duke Ellington trio album, Money Jungle, and needed to be calm and relaxed, but still with tons of intensity and emotion. Here's a quick clip of the outro to show you what I'm talking about. After we wrapped up the ballad, we moved on to one of the more upbeat songs we had, which reminds me a lot of Wes Montgomery and songs like Four on Six. This tune was especially challenging for me, as it features a drum solo first over a bass line vamp, and then has some call and response sections between quick sporadic bebop lines. I'll drop in that solo here so you can check it out and see what I mean. After finally getting a take we were all happy with, we moved on to the final tune, which was the singular funk groove track on this album. This tune allowed me to change my sound a bit and incorporate my drum tortillas for a drier sound on the drums and bring in my stack ring percussion versa stack to get that simulated clap sound. This tune went pretty quickly and alternated between a half time feel A section in 4-4 and a bridge in 6-8. At the end of the song, the drums get a chance to solo over a 6-8 vamp, and then segues into an outro with one of the most annoying multimeter sections I've had to play. After I cue out of this 6-8 vamp, it jumps into a bar of 4-4, then 2-4, 5-8, 3-4, and 7-8, before landing on a big hold in the final measure. After many run-throughs of struggling to weave this maze of an outro, I can now admit how cool of an effect it creates when the band nails it. Of course, this tune has the most fitting title of Jazz Camp, and I'll let you hear a bit of that sequence now. So right around 3 p.m., we wrapped the final tune and decided that would be a good way to wrap this whole recording session. After listening to a few tracks and saying goodbyes, it was time for me to start packing up my drums and all my other equipment. Luckily, this was also right about the time the Packer game was set to kick off, and even through some poor Wi-Fi connection, I was still able to catch some of it on my phone. 
and after five consecutive losses, it was great to see them pull out the overtime victory over the Dallas Cowboys. Since I decided to stick around the rest of the night before heading back home to Oshkosh, I joined Jason and Kate on their live stream show that night as a special guest. They do these once or twice a month for their Patreon supporters, and it was really amazing to watch them not only perform, but produce this whole stream with commercial breaks to plug merch and albums, drop in some exclusive footage from the weekend session, and even switch sets over for a Q&A, all in a live broadcast. After wrapping up the live stream, we stuck around the studio for a couple hours to celebrate a successful weekend, and then went back to the Airbnb to call it a night and get ready to head back home. After a nice night of sleep, it was time to pack up all my clothes, toiletries, recording equipment, and anything else I had lying around to get loaded up in the car and hit the road back to Oshkosh. I was able to get on the road shortly after 8 a.m., and throughout this 200-mile drive, I had a lot of time to reflect on what an uplifting and fulfilling five days it had been. I'm lucky enough to record and create music with a lot of great people in my area, but very rarely do I get the opportunity to head out of town and just focus entirely on a project without the distraction of day-to-day -day life and going home every night. There's something special about this way of doing it, and I hope to have more of these opportunities going forward. Also, I'm very grateful everything worked itself out with our almost near catastrophic health scare shutting us down. These are the kind of things I fear about with big shows, one-time events, and that sort of thing. And as much as we've learned to live with it, it's just such a bummer. We were extremely lucky this didn't shut us down, and it was more of a false alarm. Additionally, I think we all agree it was probably the best use of that time on Friday to record these tracks, as opposed to perform, given all the challenges of this music. So just a bit before noon, I pulled in back at home and was welcomed by my three pups who were excited to see me after five days. After a bit of time unwinding, I tackled unpacking and getting everything back where it belongs, and with the amount of drums, cymbals, recording equipment, and clothes I brought along, it took me a couple hours before I felt like everything was back in its right place. Keep an eye out throughout 2023 for monthly releases of each of these songs, and as some of them come out, I'll also try to release some drum cam footage on my channel. If you'd like to see more of this type of video, leave a comment down below to let me know. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to my channel to stay up to date on future video releases. Until next time, thanks.